Hey, welcome everybody to part three of our ongoing series of classes on Bayit Sheni and Geula. Last time we started Sefer Chagai, which is only two chapters, but we're going to go into them in depth. And we'll start from Pasig Gimel today, verse three, which we did, which we touched on last week. But in order for a smooth flow, we're going to start from there and just do it again quickly. The word of Hashem came through Chagai, the prophet, saying, Is it time now for you to sit covered up, protected in your nice homes? The Abayis has where this house, meaning the base, base ha Mikdash, the house of Hashem, is de, de destroyed. The Atta Koomar Hashem Svakos, and now Sosis Hashem, the Lord of hosts, Simu Levachem Al Darchechem, pay attention to your ways, to your actions. Now, this is new. Zeratim Harbe, Vahave Mat, you planted a lot, but brought home very little. Achal, the Ain Lesava, you ate, but you were not satisfied. Shasa of Ain Lashachra, you drink wine, but you don't get intoxicated from it. You don't get any of the enjoyment or pleasure of your food and drink. You wear clothing, but it doesn't keep you warm. And one who makes a profit, who earns some money, is earning the money. It's going into a pocket with a hole in it. So, I mean, you're earning something, but you're losing it. So things are going against the nature of the world. You wind up failing at everything that you are doing. So pay attention to your ways. Let's see Rashi over here on Pasuk Vav. He says, you brought home a little bit. The Avon Bikurim Shebitlu, because the sin of the Bikurim, the first fruits, that is canceled because you're not bringing the first fruits. You haven't built the base of Mikdash, so therefore you cannot fulfill the mitzvah of bringing the first fruits. Therefore, you are not bringing home many, many fruits that you're trying to grow. Achol vein Lesava, Rashi continues, you're eating, but you're not being satisfied. But Avon Bitl Menachos, and the sin of the cancellation of the mitzvah of bringing the Karban Menachos, which is the flower offerings, right? Flour, bread. Therefore, your food is not satisfying you because you don't have the merit of this mitzvah. You're drinking, but you're not benefiting from the wine as well. You're not being intoxicated from it. The taste of the wine has been taken away. Because the wine offerings, the libations have been canceled in absence of a base of mikdash. You're wearing clothing, but it's not keeping you warm. That is in the sin of the Garments of the ko- Kohanim that's been canceled. They cannot do the full avoda in the Beis HaMikdash wearing their garments. So that merit is taken away. And therefore, that also connects to the clothing. is not benefiting you the way it should. And finally, by Mistaker, Mistaker, El Tzoranakov, one who makes the money, it's going into a pocket with a hole in it. He's losing the money. Called Revach Sha'atim Osim Holech Vikala. Any profit that you earn is lost and wastes away. Kinosin Ma'osa Bekesher Beged Nakov. Like you're putting it into a, in, into a, into a, a garment, the clothing, that has a, a hole in it. The previous Rashi in Pasik Vav uh, in Pasik Hay also says it that you should see that all of your actions are don't 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 have any bracha, they don't have any blessing, and that is a direct cause and effect of not having the base hamikdash. So the light bulb should go on in your eyes. Why are we failing spectacularly in all that we're doing? It must be because we're getting punished for not having the base hamikdash, or at the very minimum, we don't have the merits of the base hamikdash. So again, translating to modern times, if you want to improve the economy. The best thing to do would be to have a base hamikdash. This is not the way su- supposedly rational people think, but we have Hashem in the world. The, the world is run by Hashem. It's one. It's run by a reward and punishment. Okay, that factors into it a lot more than our brains and hard work. We have to have Hashem on our side, and if we don't have the spiritual merits, our physical efforts are going to fall short of su- 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 success. Okay, uh, Radak. Also, I wanted to share with you on pasuk vav. It's verse six. Uh, he has a few comments. We'll just read the first one. Zeratim Harba, you planted a lot and brought home very little. Radak writes as follows. This is the opposite of the normal ways of the world. A person normally plants a little bit and harvests a lot. And he brings home more and more than what he planted. But what you're doing, your affairs are having just the opposite effect. How could you not think? Why aren't there light bulbs going up, going off in your mind? That you should realize that this is because of the punishment of the Beis Hamikdash. That you that you allowed it to stay in a state of ruins. And furthermore, even that which you do succeed to bring home, the crops that you do grow, the money that you do earn. So you're bringing that home. It has a curse in it. That if you eat, you're not satisfied. Even if you eat what would normally be a healthy 
filling meal, it doesn't satisfy you. There's just something wrong. The food enters your body and doesn't have the full effect. It doesn't satisfy you. When these abnormal things are happening, why don't you think? Examine your ways and realize what is the most likely spiritual cause? Well, we came back to Israel, started building the base of Mikdash. We stopped and we didn't restart the effort. Maybe that has something to do with it. So that's the message that they're getting now from Chagai. Continuing now with Pazik Zion, verse 7. The Lord of hosts, Simu al Same words as before. Pay attention to your ways. Alu hahar vahavesem Go up the mountain, bring down wood, and build the house. Here's a very explicit command, okay, or an explicit so, so, explicit so, 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 solution to the problem. The ertzebo, and I will be pleased with it, says Hashem. The ekavda, and I will be glorified in it. Amar Hashem. So says Hashem. Now the the ekavda, the word that I will have kavod, I will have honor and glory from it, is written uh, without. The 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 hey at the end of the word it's it's missing the the letter hey so Rashi explains why chaser hey it's missing the hey at the end this is a famous comment from Chazal the Rashi is citing because the base of Mikdash was uh, the second base of Mikdash was missing five very important things from the first base of Mikdash the letter hey is the fifth letter of the Hebrew alphabet it co- corresponds to the number five. So the fact that it's missing from the word, it doesn't change the sound of the word, but it changes the way the word appears, indicates it's, the Beis HaMikdash was lacking five things. And he names them now. Aron, the Aron HaKodesh, the, the, the Holy Ark. Urim Vitumim, this is one of the things that the Kohen Gadol would wear, and he would, uh, the, the, it, would it would light up in certain patterns of, of letters that would form words, and that would be like a pro, 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 prophetic message from Hashem. So that was missing. The Eish, the fire from heaven to come down to consume the sa- sacrifices. That didn't come down by Bayashani. They had to start their own fires, but there was no fire coming down from heaven as well. Ushchina, Hashem's glorious presence. The Ruach HaKodesh and the Holy Spirit of Hashem. Maybe the spirit of prophecy is what it's talking about there. Kedi'isa bin Maseches Yoma, as Chazal say in Maseches Yoma. So Hashem says, I'm going to be glorified in this house that I'm instructing you to build, but it's not going to be a full glory. It's going to be missing five things, which again indicates that this is a redemption, but it's a partial redemption. We're not yet getting the full redemption. We're missing five critical com- com- components of the base uh, of the base of Mikdash. Hashem will get glory. And maybe if the Jews were worthy of it, then those five things would also be restored. Kind of like, stepping into the deep waters of the pool, but we're not going for a full swim yet. He's not giving them back everything. Okay, Pasuk test, verse 9. Pano el harbe vihinei lem ut. You turn to much and you get very little. Behold, you get very little. This is a continuation of the curses that we saw before, that you're making great efforts to earn money, to be prosperous, but you're bringing home very little. We'll see in, in a moment that the meaning of this uh, of the word pano, turning, is unclear whether it's talking future tense or past tense. And you bring it home, and I blow it away, says Hashem. Why is this happening? Says Hashem, the Lord of hosts. Because my house is destroyed. And you are running each man to his own house, which echoes the beginning of this chapter that we saw last time. You're only concerned with your house, but you're not concerned with my house. And that's why I'm sending you this very, very strong message that I'm blowing away all of your prophets. Now, uh, is this talking about Past tense, again, it's sort of like echoing what he said before, because you didn't build my base of Mikdash, therefore you're suffering all of these curses, or is it a warning for the future? So Rashi and, and Ibn Ezra take the former approach and is talking about the past. We'll, we'll read Rashi, for example. Until now, you thought you would bring home a lot of produce from the fields, but instead you're getting very little. So again, it's very similar to what I said before, uh, uh, different words, but the same message, talking about the past tense, why have you been failing until now? Because you didn't yet build the base of Mikdash. However, Rav Yosef, Kara, Radak, and Mitsud David all explain the Pasuk as talking about the future tense, meaning whatever happened until now was expressed in the previous Pesukim, but this is a much stronger form of a curse, and it's a, a warning for the future. We'll read for an example, Mit, Mit, Mitsud David, Pano el Harbe, Vihine Lemat, you turn to a lot, and you wind up with very little. Ratzalamar means to say, "Im lo tishmeuli." Okay, Hina, if you don't listen to me now, meaning going forward, if you don't listen to me, then in the future he goes on to say, "Then you will have these additional problems and curses." Let's see, pasuk yud. Al kain aleichem kalu shemaim. He told, "Therefore, upon you the heavens have closed themselves up from dew. The heavens may stop themselves up from rain, 
in a time of punishment and drought. But, but for the rains, to, for the heavens to stop up even from dew is something completely out of the ordinary. The Torah promises that there's always, basically will always we be dew even in a time of drought. But here, even that's going to be taken away. But Aretz Kala Yevula, and the land will be locked up, closed up from giving forth its produce. The heavens are going to be closed. They're not going to give you water. And the earth is going to be closed. It's not going to give you its produce. But Ekra Chorev Ala Aretz, and I called a, a dry heat uh, on on the earth, the al haharem, the al hadagon, the al hatirosh, the al yitzar, and on the mountains, the grains, the what, the wine and the oil, the al asher tolzi adama, and whatever else the earth will will cast out, the al adam, the al behema, the al kol yigiyakapayim, and on the people and on the animals and all the toil of your hands. In other words, you are going to be failing in everything that you do. You will be utterly destitute. Okay, so again, Rashi and and Radak say that this is talking about the past, that this is what had already happened as a punishment or a consequence of not having the base of Mikdash built. But others, Rav Kara, Rav Radak, and Matuta Sabbat, all say that this is a warning to the future. If you continue to not rebuild the base of Mikdash, then the punishments that you had until now are going to get even worse. Now, why would they take this approach? Because it doesn't seem to fit the words quite so well. It's not clear that this is a warning from the future. It seems also to be talking about the past. Therefore, this happened. It doesn't say, therefore, this will happen. It kind of stretching the words a little bit. And in fact, uh, this this is a big chiddush. Rav Yosef Kara even takes the former message about the about the food not satisfying them and the money falling out of holes in their pocket as also as as also uh, not really being critical of the people. Let's let's go back a little bit and see what he says on pasuk vav. This is verse six. Rav Yosef Kari here de, de, departs from all the other commentaries and how he explains it. He says, that you planted a lot, but you brought home very little. Therefore, you should know, or you can know, that it was not yet time to build the Mesa Mikdash during the time of Daryavesh, the king of Persia. Because there was not a blessing in your actions. Because you planted a lot, but you brought home very little. So Rav Yosef Kara is very clearly differing from the other Mepharshim. He very clearly says, it's not that you're being punished for not building the Beis HaMikdash. It's just a natural consequence of not having a Beis HaMikdash is that you're not going to have a blessing in what you do. In other words, according to Rav Yosef Kara, until now, the Navi is not being critical of the people. He's simply informing them why they were not su successful because they didn't have the merits of the Beis HaMikdash. According to all the other commentaries, they say that this is a punishment. The reason why they're they're not producing much is because they're being punished for not building the Mesa Mikdash. Rav Yosef Kava really softens the message a lot, and he continues with that theme over here, where he says the next message is also talking about the future, where almost all the other commentaries say that it's going on the past, or at the very least, even if it's going, even even if you see, even if they say it's going on the future, they say the first message is also going on the past. Rav Yosef Kara says the first message is informing them that they didn't have the merits of the Mesa Mikdash, and therefore they should have known that it was not yet the time to build it. Had it been the time to build it, Hashem would have started giving them blessing, I guess, to urge them along to build it. And he says, even the second second prophecy, the second message is also going on in the future, that if you don't build it now, then you'll be punished in the future. So according to Rav Yosef Kara, at no point were these people actually being punished for not having built the Beis HaMikdash. This is different than all the other commentaries. They say at least at some point, they were being punished, plus a warning for the future. Rav Yosef Kara says in the past, it was simply a natural consequence of not having the Beis HaMikdash, from which they could have known from the fact that they were failing that it was not yet the time to build. Hashem wasn't readying the playing field for them to build the Beis HaMikdash. But when the blessing starts to come, that's a sign Hashem is with them and he's urging them along to build it. And if they don't build it, once they get that positive reinforcement, the positive message, then they will get a punishment. So Rav Yosef Kara is really softening it. It doesn't fit the words very well, though. So the question is, why does he differ from all the other commentaries? And why do at least some of the commentaries take part of the message and say it's talking about the future, and, and it's not all a punishment. It's not all critical of the people. Why are they softening the message? Well, if we think back to context about the people, the human beings that Haggai is talking to, we're talking about a skeleton crew of approximately 42,360 people who made the arduous journey back to Israel while most of the Jews stayed in Gaulus. And these were mostly elderly people, and they were very weak. And they were stopped by an order from the king. And they were surrounded by enemies. They had everything against them. And they tried. They made a sincere, serious effort to rebuild the base of Mikdash. And they were stopped in the middle. So they were, they were, they had it, they had it up against them from all sides. 
So it wouldn't really be fair for Hashem to go guns blazing at these people, fire and brimstone. How dare you not build the base of Mikdash? You're terrible sinners. You're horrible people. I'm going to pour out my wrath upon you and curse you in every way. That doesn't, it's not fair. These people are so downtrodden and they tried. They really tried. It wouldn't be fair. So that's why most of the Mepharshim soften at least part of the message and say he's talking about the future. It's a warning now. If you don't build the base of Mikdash now, then you will be punished. And Rav Yosef Kara says they're not being punished at all. All of this is at most a warning to the future. He's simply explaining to them that your failure until this point is simply because it wasn't the right time. And now you need to build it. Otherwise, you'll get punished in the future. But none of it is actually critical of them, which is a big stretch. It's a very big stretch on the words because it certainly seems to be critical of them. Never it says you're all running to your to your homes. That seems to be very strong criticism. But Rav Yosef Kara is bending over backwards to soften the message because he can't reconcile that Haggai and Hashem would be giving the people wrath and fire and brimstone considering the, the, the context. I think that's why he bends over backwards to soften the message. It's very important to remember who he's actually talking to. Okay, let's continue. Pasuk Yud Beis, verse 12. Vayishma Zerubavel ben Shaltiel. So Zerubavel ben Shaltiel, again, he was the governor. The, the, he was the direct descendant of King David. Yoshua ben Yotzadak, a Kohen HaGadol. And Yoshua ben Yotzadak, the Kohen Gadol. So these were both the spiritual and po- political leaders. V'chol she'er sa'am, and all of the remnant of the people. Again, we're not talking about a large group of people. The call Hashem Elokein. They heard, they listened to the voice of Hashem, their God. What is this voice exactly? We'll see in a moment. V'al divrei Chagai Hanavi, kasher shlachu Hashem Elokein. And, and to the words of Chagai the prophet, as Hashem, their God, sent them. So we have the voice of Hashem and the words of Chagai. I would think that's one and the same, but clearly they're two different things. V'yiru ha'am yipnei Hashem. And the people were afraid before Hashem, meaning they took the warning and the message very, very seriously. So what is this voice of Hashem and words of Chagai? Here we have really incredible comments from Ibn Ezra and Radak. Again, to look it up yourself, is Pasuk Yud Beis, verse 12. Ibn Ezra says as follows, Vayishma Bekol, they heard the voice, the voice of Hashem, Shehem Chayavim Livnos Beis Hashem, that they were obligated to build the house of Hashem, the Beis HaMikdash, Afilu Lo Hisnabe al Kain even if the Navi did not prophesy that for them. The voice of Hashem was, Hashem is sending them subtle signs, subtle messages. I want you to build the Mesa Mikdash. You should have gotten the message. We talked about this last time as well, that they shouldn't have needed a prophet. And here, Eben Ezra is making the same statement. They, were, they, they understood that they were obligated to build the Mesa Mikdash, even had a Navi not told them to do so. They should have known it on their own. That's a very, very strong comment from Eben Ezra. And Radak says as follows, Even though Chagai did not prophesy it for them, although that's a little, the wording is a little strange, because in Pasuk Ches, verse 8, he seems to, in fact, have given them that instruction. He says, go up the mountain, bring the wood, build the house, right? That seems to be an explicit instruction. So maybe it means to say, had I not uh, instructed you to do it, or maybe he believes that this instruction was not fully explicit as, as, as an instruction. Maybe he was just you know advising them to do it, but not obligating them to do it, sort of giving them a choice and telling them the consequences of not doing it. So it's a, you know, very strong message, but not yet, you know, an actual mitzvah. Either way, he says, even though Chagai had not or or or, or did not fully prophecy for them to do this, hadin haya imoem libno sabayat, the proper thing for them to do was to build the house. Because they saw that their actions, their lives were not going properly. Things were not working out the way they should. It was going opposite the ways of the world. They were failing in very abnormal ways. It was incumbent upon them to examine their ways. Again, we talked about this last time too. People get very offended when you try to connect punishments to sin or tragic events to sins. But this is our obligation. When bad things happen, certainly when they're very abnormal things, that's a clear voice of Hashem talking to us. We might not merit to have a Navi. We shouldn't need a Navi. Hashem is sending us a message. We have to examine our ways and try to rectify the ultimate cause of these problems. This is what it means when it says the voice of Hashem, your God. Because Hashem commanded us in the Torah, that you should not go with me in happenstance. Say, if something bad happened. Eh, it's just a coincidence. Bad things happen. Tragedies happen. That's the way of the world. That's not the way to go with Hashem. When bad things happen, they should examine their deeds. They should not say that it is just a co- coincidence. It's happenstance, the way of the world. They were further awakened 
to rebuild the base of Mikdash by the words of Chagai and Avi, that Hashem sent Chagai to them. So the voice of Hashem was the unspoken message, just the events of their lives and the events of the world. They should have gotten the message from Hashem. And then he sent them a more explicit message through the words of Chagai. But both Ibn Ezra and, and Radak agree that even in absence of a Navi, the Kol Hashem, the voice of Hashem, should have been enough. They should have recognized that it was their obligation to build the Beis HaMikdash. Of course, this is a message to us as well to see, look for, and listen to the voice of Hashem. Pasuk Yud Gimel is another incredible Pasuk, and it is uh, all in Tanakh. There's no Pasuk quite like it. Vayomer Chagai, Malach Hashem, Bimalachus Hashem, La'am Lamar. And Chagai, the Malach Hashem, which means a messenger of Hashem, an angel is always a messenger of Hashem. They're human beings that are also called the Malach of Hashem. They're sent to do a, a message or a job from Hashem. So Chagai, the messenger of Hashem, said, the Malach Hashem, as a messenger of Hashem, La'am Lamar to the people saying, Ani itchem um Hashem. What was the message? I am with you, so says God. So first of all, the wording of this Pasuk is very, very strange. You won't find the Pasuk like this anywhere else. Okay, we have many prophets giving messages to people, performing jobs from Hashem, and it may call them a messenger of Hashem, but this is the only time it says that the messenger of Hashem said as a messenger of Hashem. Well, you just told me he's the messenger of Hashem. Obviously, that's how he's talking. And then the message itself is very, very strange. I am with you, says Hashem. Now again, imagine he's talking to real human beings. Okay, Chagai, the Navi, gathers the people. He gets up in the public square. He calls for attention. Everybody turns to the Navi. He has a message, right? Hashem is going to speak to them. What's them? They're all waiting expectantly. Chagai opens his mouth and he says, I am with you, says Hashem. Oh, that's a good start. Very encouraging. People are waiting. Okay, wh what does he want us to do? Chagai says, that's it. That's the end of the message. Go home. I'm done. What kind of message? I'm, I'm with you. What is this? A pep talk? I'm with you. Rah, rah. What, what is this? I'm with you, says Hashem. That's it. And the answer is, again, think of these people that he's talking to. Okay, first of all, he had to say, I am, I'm speaking as a messenger of Hashem, not as a rabbi, because Chagai was also a Gadol Hadar. He was a rabbi. He was a posseg, right? Chagai is quoted in, in Shas, in, in, the, in, in, the, in, in the Talmud. His rulings are passed down in the Talmud. He was a teacher of Torah, right? So sometimes he was speaking as a prophet. He was giving a direct message from Hashem. Sometimes he was not speaking in a spirit of prophecy. He was speaking as an ordinary, I mean, Great man, but a human being speaking as a rabbi, a Talmud Chacham, a scholar, a judge, etc. So Chagai, the Torah is making it explicitly, the Navi is making it explicitly clear here that when he gives you this message, I am I am with you, says Hashem. He's not speaking as a rabbi giving a drush and shul. Go do the work, be positive. Hashem's with you, have faith. That would be an ordinary rabbi talk. Chagai wasn't wearing his rabbi hat when he said this. He was wearing his Navi hat. He's saying, I'm speaking to you now as a prophet. I have a message from Hashem. Hashem told me to say, I am with you. That is much more powerful than a pep talk from a rabbi, which may be just as true, but it's not certifiably as true. It's not as powerfully true as a Navi saying, Hashem told me to tell you that I am with you. Can't argue with that. You can't get down after he says that. That, 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 is, that, is, that is the strongest pep talk possible. So that's why the Pasuk emphasizes Chagai, the messenger of Hashem, was speaking now, not as a rabbi, but as a prophet, as a messenger of Hashem. What is the message? I am with you. No further instructions. That's what the people needed to hear. Again, he's pushing them to rebuild the base of Mikdash, and they're scared because they're violating the order of the king. They don't yet have permission from the king to rebuild. They're surrounded by the enemies. They're elderly. They're weak. They're downtrodden. They're poor. They're unsuccessful. Haggai is giving them a push, a positive push from Hashem. After all these threats and warnings and curses and possible punishments, according to most of the commentaries, he's saying, Hashem says, I'm with you. Don't worry. Go ahead. Move forward. That's the extent of the message. It's a very, very beautiful prophecy. In two words, I am with you. So says Hashem. Okay? Pasuk Yud Dalin. Vayor Hashem es ruach Zerubavel ben Shaltiel pachat Yudah. And Hashem awakened the spirit of Zerubavel ben Shaltiel, the governor of Yehuda. Again, the people wanted to do the right thing. They were listening to the voice of Hashem, and Hashem helped them along as well, pushed them up, pushed them forward, awakened their spirit. Vyas ruach Yoshua ben Yotzadak ha-Kohen ha-Gadol, the spirit of Yoshua ben Yotzadak the kohen Godol. Vyas ruach kol she'er sam, and the spirit of all the remnants of the people. Hashem made them feel more positive, more alive, more ener energized to do this. And they came and they did the work in the house of Hashem, the Lord of hosts, their God. They got the message. They heard the voice. They heard the words. They heard the pep talk. And Hashem pushed them forward a little bit as well, gave them a little bit of a boost. And then they were able to move forward and do the job. One more pasuk to finish the parak. This happened on the 24th day 
of the sixth month, Bishnas Shtaim Daryavesh Hamelach, in the second year of King Daryavesh. So that concludes the first parak of Chagai. And I want to just interrupt before we get to the second chapter with identifying a little bit more about who these people were. This is very, very important. Because we always have to realize that even though Chagai is talking to us today, no less than he's talking to the people who lived during his time, this prophecy was directed to a specific group of people, human beings, that were standing for, before him hearing it live. So again, we saw before that there were 42,363 Jews. Most of them were elderly. And the sounds of the people crying, we, we saw this in Sefer Ezra in the, in the first part of the series, they were crying when they laid the foundations of the base of Mikdash because they recognized it was going to be smaller in com comparison, not as glorious to the first base HaMikdash. And here we're going to learn a very, very astounding lesson. It comes from the G -G Gemara Horius, Davav Amad Aleph, 6a in Horius, a very small Masechet of Gemara, not widely studied. And it's the kind, kind of thing that if you're not, if you are studying it, you really got to be paying attention. Otherwise, you just glide through it and you miss a, a most incredible message. Okay, so we're going to start here. And I'm going to skip around a little bit because part of it is not so relevant for us. And I don't want you to get bogged down in legalistic details about the sacrifices. So the Gemara says, this is the top line. Kayotzibo Amar Rabbi Yossi. So similar to what the Gemara was talking about previously, Rabbi Yossi said, those who came from the captives of the exile, this is from Sefer Ezra, we, okay, in Perak, Perak Ches, uh, chapter 8, the, the, the exiles brought forth sacrifices, olos, burnt offerings to the God of Israel, parim shnei asar, 12 bullocks, they brought as, as sacrifices to Hashem. Hakol ola, Okay, all of them were burnt offerings. The Gemara is trying to identify what are these sacrifices. Where do you see people bringing 12, sacri 12 olos? This is the Tzibor. This is the whole, this is the whole Klal Yisrael, at least the ones in Israel. Why are they bringing 12 bulls? What does that signify? It doesn't have anything to do with, with, with a holiday. So, so what is it all about? So the Gemara says, Hakol ola salkadaytach. First of all, can you say that they were all burnt offerings? After shechatas ola, can you say that a chatas, a sin offering, is burnt as an ola? The, the Gemara says these were not actually burnt offerings. They were sin offerings. <speaking in Hebrew> Rather, what it means is they were all like a burnt offering. <speaking in Hebrew> Just as a burnt offering is not eaten, it's all burnt up. <speaking in Hebrew> also, this particular sin offering was not eaten either, but all burnt up. This is an exception to the normal rule of sin offerings or part of the sacrifices eaten. This one was all burnt up. The Tanya, for we learned in Abraisa, Rabbi Yehuda Omer, Rabbi Yehuda says, Alavoda Zara Heviyam. Why did they bring these 12 sacrifices? They brought it for the sin of idolatry. This was to be a ka, ka, ka para, an atonement for the sin of idolatry. What sin of idolatry are we talking about? But Amar Rabbi Yehuda Omer Shmuel, Rabbi Yehuda further said in the name of Shmuel, this is not Rabbi Yehuda the Tana, but Rav, Rabbi Yehuda the Amora, said in the name of Shmuel, Alavoda Zara Sha'asu Bimei Tzidkiyahu. It's for the sin of idolatry that they did in the times of Sitkiyo, who was the last of the kings during the first base of Mikdash, 70 plus years earlier. That's why they brought these 12 sacrifices, actually much more than 70 years already, later by the time they built this. Okay, so they this is going back already to Bayes Rishon. They are atoning for the sin of idolatry that they did during the times of Sid, 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 Sid almost, almost, almost a century earlier. Now they are atoning for it. So the Gemara now uh, goes into some technical details. Bishlam al Rabbi Huda, it makes sense according to the opinion of Rabbi Yehuda in the previous Mishnah. Mishkachas la lahani shnei And no more yogurts? Only one yogurt? No. Is that good or not? The only yogurt in the whole store? Nothing else. Okay. What store do you sell to? Please make sure everybody's muted. Okay. Please make sure everybody's muted. So it makes sense according to the opinion of Rabbi Yehuda in the Mishnah that you have a case. Of bringing twelve offerings for people doing avodazara for the tzibur doing avodazara kigon for example how would that be the chatu shnei masar shvatim when all twelve tribes sinned with idolatry the maisu shnei masar seirim because then he holds his opinion is that they would bring twelve sin offerings okay inami alternatively the chatu shiva shvatim that seven tribes which is a majority of the tribes sinned with idolatry v'shara inach and the other five were dragged along dragged along. If most of the tribes are serving idolatry 
And then they have to bring a sacrifice as atonement. So all the tribes bring a sacrifice as well, even those who didn't serve the idolatry. That's the opinion of Rabbi Ye Yehuda, where if most of the tribes are serving idolatry, then you have to bring one for each of the 12 tribes. So that makes sense that they had 12 sin offerings. Well, the Rabbi Shimon, according to Rabbi Shimon, who has a different opinion, Nami Mishkacha, so we can also find a case that they would bring 12 sin offerings. Kigon, for example, the Chatu Achara Sarshvatim, let's say 11 tribes had sinned, the Maisu Achara Sarsiirim, that they would then bring 12 uh, said they would bring 11 sacrifices for Edoch the basin. And one would be basin. One would be for the court that ruled in favor of them serving idolatry. It's hard for us to fathom that a basin would ever rule that the, either the entire mitzvah of idolatry is canceled or part of the mitzvah of, of idolatry is canceled, but it's on the books. Theoretically, it could have happened. And it seems to me that it actually did happen, that a Jewish court had ruled that they should serve idolatry. So according to, to Rabbi, Rabbi Shimon, if all 12 tribes sin with, with idolatry, they bring 13 sacrifices. One for each of the 12 tribes, plus one for the basin, for the court. So how do you have a case where they're bringing 12 sacrifices, where 11 tribes had sinned? So you get one for each tribe. The 12th tribe that didn't sin is not dragged along, but you do have that 12th one, plus one for the basin. So that makes sense to Pasuk and Ezra that they had 12 sin offerings for I idolatry. El al Rabbi Meir, but according to Rabbi Meir, to Amar based in Mevian Velot Sibor, Rabbi Meir says, if all of Klal Yisrael, if all the Jewish people are serving idolatry based on a court order to do so, we see from here, you don't just blindly follow the courts, the rabbis, even the Sanhedrin itself. You don't blindly follow them. If they're wrong, they're wrong. You have to know better, especially when it comes to idolatry. So Rabbi Meir says, if everybody sinned with idolatry, only the based in, only the court brings the sin offering. And Velot Sibor and not the Sibor, so how could you? How could it be possible, according to his opinion, that the Jews would bring twelve sin offerings? So the Gemara answers: that they sin and they sinned again and they sinned again twelve times. They did. They did the sin of idolatry twelve times. The court had ruled twelve times that they should serve idolatry, and the people followed the court. So then they have to bring 12 sacrifices. Imagine such a thing, that they were so steeped in idolatry that the greatest rabbis, the greatest courts, and all the people are serving idolatry as many as 12 times. So then the Gemara questions this. Okay? He says, wait a second. Okay? That should be, if people serve idolatry and the courts are encouraging them to serve idolatry, ruling that they should, the individuals who sinned, should be bringing the sin offerings. They should do tshuva and bring the sin offerings. So these people weren't there. So Amar Rav Papa, so Rav Papa said, uh, When we have a tri tri tradition, a Jewish law that we know, dating back to Har Sinai, that a carbon chatas, a sin offering, where the owner of the sin offering uh, dies, and therefore the animal is also put to death, meaning you don't offer a sin offering for a sinner who, let's say he sinned and he did tshuva and he set aside an animal to be brought as a sacrifice and then he drops dead before he has a chance to bring it, you don't bring the sin offering. So the Gemara is questioning, how could we have brought these sin offerings for people that were already long dead, right? So the Gemara answers, when we learn this law that you don't bring it for the sinner who is dead, hani mili biyachid, that's only with an in, 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 in individual who sinned and died. Avalo but tzibor, but not if it's the whole Klal Yisrael, the tzibor, the public. If the public sins, then even if the public dies and it's a new group of people, many years later, they can still uh, atone for the sin. You still bring the carbon. Lefisha ain misa betzibur, because the public never dies. People die, but the Jewish people never die. The public never dies. So therefore, if there was a public sin and a public sin offering that needed to be brought, then even if the individuals who did the sin are no longer here, you can still bring the public sin offering. That is explained by Rav Papa. Now, the Gemara tries to find the source for Rav Papa. We'll skip a little bit. It offers one possibility for a source, and it re re rejects it. And then we're going to skip to the final con 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 conclusion as to his source. Okay? At the time of the Rav Papa, mehacha. rather the reason for Rav Papa, that if, if it's a public sacrifice, if it's a public sin offering, you do bring it, even if the people who sinned are dead. We learn it from here. As it says, Kaper la'amcha Yisrael Shepadiso Hashem. This is by the Egla Arufa, when somebody is found murdered in the middle of nowhere on a road be between two cities and they can't find the murderer and we don't even know which city the murderer came from. So they have to do what's called an Egla Arufa. They 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 basically kill an, an animal and make a big public outcry over what happened and hopefully they'll find the killer because of that. And if not, the public spectacle and this ritual will be an and atonement for the Jewish people. So, Reuya kapara zu al This kapara, this atonement, 
is worthy of being an atonement for all the Jews that left Egypt, who obviously are long dead. Okay, so we learn from here, from the says, the Jews that you re, 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 redeemed from Egypt, that this should be an atonement even for the Jews who left Egypt, who are long dead when you're doing this ritual. So we see from here that if there's a public crime, a public sin offering, that that can be an atonement even for people that are dead. So the Gemara challenges this. Me, dummy, can you compare the two? Hasam, kulu, isinun. Right there, all of them are still around. Migo, or at least many of them. Migo de mechapra chayim, mechapra nami amesim. Right, since some of them are still alive, and it's an atonement for the people who are alive, it's also a a, a kapara for the people that are dead during the times of the egla arufa. There are some people who are involved in the sin in some way who are alive. So since it's being an atonement for the people who are alive, it can also be an atonement for the people that are that are long dead. So that works. Alahacha, but here with the twelve sin offerings and in in say for Ezra. Mihavuchayim, where the people still alive, all the people who did the sin were dead. They did the sin during the end of Bayis Rishon. This is 70 plus years earlier, a long, long time ago, 80 plus years already by now. They're all dead. So how could they bring a public sin offering when every individual who did the idolatry is dead? So the Gemara says, Enachinami, indeed, they were still alive. They were still alive. Because it says, this is from chapter 3 in Perak Gimel and say for Ezra, which we did in part 1, that many of the Kohanim and the Levim and the heads of the fathers of the households were there. Okay, so there were indeed old timers from Bias Rishon who were there. They had sinned with idolatry. They were exiled from Israel. They lived through the destruction and seven years of exile and came back. They were the original sinners. And since there were some of the original sinners still there for the public offering, they were still allowed to bring the public offering. And the Gemara challenges this as well. The Dilma Mu'atin Havu Rabba, maybe it was only a mi minority of the people who were there bringing the, the sacrifice and not a majority, in which case they shouldn't have been able to bring. If there was one or two sinners who happened to live an extremely long time, they shouldn't have been able to bring a public offering for, for the whole nation. You know, probably just a small number of people. Okay, so the Gemara says the but it says it says uh, It's it was not a minority of people. It was a majority of people. A majority of the people who were there at the beginning of Bias Rishon who lived through the Gullahs and came back were the original sinners who served idolatry. Most of the people who came back in Bayis, in Bayis Shani, at least in the in the beginning, were not the children and the grandchildren. It was the old timers. And the Gemara proves it from this passage that we saw that that uh, many of them were, were, were still there. And in fact, most of them were there because the sounds of the people crying drowned out the people who were joyous and singing when they laid the foundations of the base of Mikdash, right? How could it be that the sounds of the people crying drowned out the people, the sounds of the people who were cel celebrating? It must be because there were more of them. So most of the people that were there at Bayashani were A, extremely old people, and C, were former idol worshippers. And they had done shuva, okay? And that's why Hashem allowed them to bring the carbon. And the Gemara now, here comes a real bombshell. If, if, if it hasn't been enough of a bombshell yet, listen to the next question. But they were intentional, they were willful sinners. And Rashi explains, Doro shel Tzidkiah, the generation of Tzidkiah, they were willful sinners. They were not accidental sinners. It's not, not that they sinned out of ignorance. They knew what they were doing. They served the Vodazara on purpose. They were wicked. Ubene katla ninhu. They were guilty of death. What do you do with somebody who serves idolatry intentionally? The base didn't executes him. What, what do you mean you're bringing a sacrifice to atone for? How were they given the opportunity to bring a sacrifice and atone for it? They should have been put to death. And if the courts don't put them to death, Hashem should have killed them. Hashem should have given them kares. So how could it be that they were bringing a sacrifice to atone? They could not atone. There is no atonement for willful idol worshippers. They can do tshuva and mitigate the punishment, but they still have to get punished. They, they can't cheat death. So what happens? Below B'nai Karban in Rashi says they are not eligible to bring a sacrifice. How could they have an atonement with these sin offerings? They're not allowed to bring a sin offering. It's useless. Hashem doesn't accept such a sin offering. Listen to what the Gemara says here. Three more lines. Haras Shah Haisa. It was a one-time ruling. It was an emergency ruling. In other words, it was against the Jewish law. It was a one-time exception. Rashi explains, Haras Shah Haisa, the Afal Gav, the Hav Mazidin, the even though they were intentional, willful sinners, Havu Miskaprim, they could still receive an atonement. It was, this was a special ruling against the normal Jewish law that they were given the opportunity to bring sacrifices, which Hashem accepted, and he atoned for their willful idolatry. 
Now, again, who made this ruling? Well, you can't just pull a ruling out of thin air. Say, look, I feel bad for these people. I'm just going to make a ruling. No one has the power to do that. So what's the harasha? It must be that a Navi got a message from Hashem. I want these people to bring sacrifices. I'll, I'll be pleased with their sacrifices. I will accept them and I will atone for their sin of idolatry against all the rules. Hashem says, I make the rules. I can break the rules. I'm going against the rule. This is a special emergency ruling to, for these sinners to bring a sacrifice and I will accept it and I will atone for them. Now, first of all, why would Hashem do this? Why would Hashem do this? Why would he break the rules for them? Again, when you think about the context of what's going on, who are these people? These are people who, first of all, have done tshuva. They're sorry that they did the Yavod Azar. Normally, that's not enough. Not enough for them to be able to bring a sacrifice and to get a full atonement. But nevertheless, think about what they went through. They went through 70 years of Gullahs. And they were waiting expectantly for the opportunity to go back to Israel. Now they're old people. They're going into enemy territory, surrounded by enemies. Okay? Their children and grandchildren are making fun of them. These foolish old timers that are trekking back to Israel. Life is good in Gullus. We have vineyards. We have fields. We have nice homes. The king is good to us. Right? We're getting along with the Goyim. Life is great in Gullus. We have Costco and Target. Life is good. Why do you got to go back to Israel? It's a wasteland surrounded by enemies. Rebuild again. What do you need the Tsaras for? Stay in Gullus. Elio and Avi didn't come. Mashiach didn't come. The Lubavitch Rebbe didn't come. Right? The heavens didn't open. Gogomogog didn't come. What are you doing? Going back to Israel. The rabbis say, stay in Gullus. All the great rabbis are in Gullus. What are you doing? And these people said, no, we understand. Hashem wants us to go back at the end of the 70 years. So we're going to go. We're old people. It's hard to go. We're up against everything, but we're going to do this anyway. We're sorry we served idolatry and we're going to go. We're going to make an exceptional effort. We're going to do something completely out of the ordinary to serve Hashem. Hashem says, you're breaking all the rules, all the normal rules of normal living. Normal living would be an old man should stay in Gullus with his family, live out his days and hope for the future. You're doing something exceptional. You're pushing yourself to serve me against all rhyme and reason. I'm going to do something exceptional for you. I'm going to break the rules and I'm going to clean the slate. I'm going to atone for your sin of idolatry. You're not going to die from it. You're not going to be executed. You're not going to get punished in the next world either. I'm going to give you an opportunity to bring a sacrifice and clean the slate. You did something for me, exceptional. I'm going to do something exceptional for you, says Hashem. Imagine that. And imagine how the people must have felt when they brought these sacrifices and they knew that their slate was now clean. Imagine the weight that was lifted off their chest. This burden of idolatry. They were the ones who are immediately responsible for the destruction of the Vesemit. They lived through the destruction, right? They sealed the deal. They sealed the fate. With their idolatry, all the sins that had been piled up by their predecessors, they were the ones who lived through it. So they had this guilt, this responsibility of the destruction of the base of Mikdash, of the exile, all the harm that they caused, right? And they were living with this guilt for 70 years. Now they're old men and they come back and Hashem says, I'm giving you a chance to do atonement. I'm going to take it away. Imagine the weight that must have been lifted from these people, that all the Jews that are laughing at them and mocking them for coming back to Israel, they knew that Hashem was with them and Hashem did something exceptional by allowing them to bring the sacrifice. This is a very, very beautiful message and it drives home the point. If we do something exceptional for Hashem, Hashem will do something exceptional for us. We would like to encourage our viewers to share these videos with friends and send in your responses. If you would like to obtain Birkon Nusach Eretz Yisrael or invite the rabbi for a speaking engagement, please email us at office at machonchilo.org.